welcome everybody. Good morning. This is Shop Talks brought to you by Ink Kitchen, which is an online free information source and uh, Impressions Magazine and the show here. See our sponsors on either side that make all this information possible for free. So big shout out to them. Got Stan Banks from T-Shirt Side Hustle. Gary Cantor from Hirsch who sells Tajima machines here and other machines. And we're gonna talk about financing. Gonna talk a little bit, a few uh, questions I'll ask them and then we'll open it up to you guys and we'll try to uh, part some information and answer your questions. And then they'll be around afterwards if you wanna ask them if you're shy. All right, so Gary's going to kind of handle the, uh, the bigger shop questions and Stan, the, the beginners and, and above. All right, so how much money do you need to get started decorating? Uh, that's a trick question. It's kind of Yeah, it's a there. trick question. Um, to, to get in this industry, I came in as a broker, so it didn't really cost me anything. I just knew where to go get printed. Right? Zero. Um, so Magic words were? Contract printing. <laughs> he like, I don't know why he let us so much. But I, I started out as a broker, um, and for me, I wasn't necessarily trying to get into the t-shirt business. I just found myself in the t-shirt business. So once I started to learn a little bit more and a little bit more about where to get shirts and what equipment I wanted uh, from a beginning phase, I started really, really small. Um, once I bought my own equipment with the heat press and a vinyl cutter, and then you can kind of grow from there with screen print equipment, with embroidery equipment, depending on what direction that you want to go. So someone that's never been here before, what, what are we talking for a beginning thing that might only last you a short time so you can graduate, sort of? Which one? Like heat pressing, a, like, screen, screen Yeah, print? heat press, and embroidery think, machine, vinyl cutter. What's the, rent, what's the bottom and so, to, to do actually some work? So uh, for a heat press, obviously we know Amazon and different things like that have the cheapest stuff available, but I mean, obviously you want to get the best that you can afford. So whatever money that you have, I think it's more important to get started than it is to go out and save up for the, the Hotronics Fusion IQ or one of the, one of the top impresses because you'll make the money on the way in order to get there. So, you know, I told Rick before we start, so I got one good piece of information <laughs> for, this, for this segment, uh, but so, so for something like a heat press, anything under a thousand bucks, right? You can get started, you can get going, you can use transfers, use vinyl to get your business rolling. And then you figure out what you like and then you grow from there. Uh, get into screen printing, I think you need at least somewhere around four to $5,000 to have a serious setup to be in business. You know, not thinking about a DIY starter kit or, you know, myself standing on screens, but in order to get, you know, somewhere around at least a four color, four station, you need a dry and exposure unit. You need at least the bare minimum, probably like five grand used. And then you obviously it scales up and grows from there. I got one three used if anyone wants one. Oh, yeah. We did. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and actually some of it's mentality too. Like yesterday you were talking about like about putting the money aside. Like I want us to talk a little bit about that. Just some people just don't think that way. So Yeah, so my one good piece of information for all of you guys, if you take anything away, you can probably, well, I'm not going to say you can leave because he got a lot more information for you guys. But as far as it goes, uh, Lou from Toe Wing Solutions here in New, Jer uh, in New Jersey basically told me, he said, there's little jobs pay the bills, the big ones you put away. And then if you can't buy it three times, don't buy it because you won't have the capital to for anything that goes wrong. So, you know, think about it, getting into your first embroidery machine around 10K or something like that. You know, you'll get a job for a school and you think about a school, a football team or something like that, depending on what you're selling, you could easily clear 10, 13 grand, five grand, six grand on a few jobs, but that money is not necessarily the money that you should be using to pay the bills unless you absolutely have to because you have the smaller orders that could take care of that. So that way you put that money aside. So now if you're looking at something that's a little bit more expensive, you, you have some funds off to the side that can do it. So you think about 10 grand, you know, you want to have 20, 30 grand away just in case you need to buy something else, or something goes wrong, anything that may happen. But we always tend to like set our eyes on the prize, get enough, buy it. You know, I've been in situations where I couldn't, uh, I had to borrow money for big college orders that came in and when I got started, like, man, I didn't expect orders to come in this way. And then you get into the game where you don't get paid for 30 days, 90 days. It turns into a long-form uh, deal. So, 
you know, for me, that was Good like way to get your knuckles broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no question. So for me, that was like the the best advice I ever got when I when I got started early, probably in like early 2017, where he told me that. Literally, he said, "The small jobs pay the bills. The big jobs, you set that aside and you and you save it for a rainy day, and that's where you get your money to buy equipment and pay how you pay for it in cash." All right, if you're not paying for it in cash. Or even if you are, what, what are some ways, what, how your customers finance like a serious piece of equipment that may have the payback, but how do they get the money in the first place? What are the different options? Yeah, there are, uh, there are a number of options, although, you know, somewhat limited. Uh, and uh, sadly, it, it, it is uh, what you're going to pay is going to be based on your financial record. Uh, the poorer you are, the more you pay for the money, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, that's the way of the world. Um, but briefly, I'm going to run through what I have to say. Uh, my name's Gary Cantor. I'm, uh, uh, I have a, uh, an embroidery shop. We run 28 heads out of uh, Long Beach, New York. I've been doing that for about 30 years. Um, and for about 20 years, I've been working with Hirsch Solutions. We sell uh, Tajima, uh, Brother Director Garment, Color Reel, some other items as well. Uh, so I've got a good feel of the business from either side. I'm not a financial expert. I don't. Uh, That's why I asked you. <laughs> right, right. So I don't <laughs> represent any financial uh, company or interest. Um, obviously, if you've got the cash up front or if you've got the means, you could pay for your equipment outright. That's typically the best, although that's, uh, that's more of a rare opportunity. Uh, so... Um, you know, uh, barring winning the lottery or having uh, rich relatives that would be uh, willing to financially back you, uh, look at the, um, and, and what Stan said uh, was a good point as far as uh, equipment. You do want to get the best possible equipment without hurting yourself financially because the best equipment will give you the best end result. And when your product goes out into the field, you're no longer there. So your product is representing yourself. You want people to see what you're doing and you want them to say, well, where did you get that? That looks stellar. I want that guy. And that guy is somebody who has equipment that will outproduce other, um, other lesser, uh, lesser equipment that doesn't do as good a job or doesn't, uh, doesn't last. Um, but besides that, you want to ask the manufacturer, uh, do you do your own financing? So for argument's sake, uh, currently Brother is running a 0% financing program for three years. So that's great. You're playing with their money. It's other people's money. They're willing to put their, uh, their, uh, their finances behind you because they believe in their equipment. But that's, um, that's not often the case. It's, it's kind of a rare situation. And in order to get that, that isn't open to everybody. It's open to people that would have a credit score of 680 or above. And then as your credit score goes down, um, you'll start paying more or you'll, pay, you'll start paying interest charges. Um, if the manufacturer is not offering uh, so some... Let's, let's just stick, stick on that one for a moment. Yep. So they do that, what, because they can sell the ink probably, right? Well, is that, on the, a, is on that a, part of the deal? Yes, yeah, so on screen printing, direct to garment. Hey, if you go to Walmart and you buy a home printer, the printer is $40. Your first... Your first cartridge is $60. So where are they making their money? They're making their money on the consumables. They used but to give them free even. You buy a computer, you would get a printer, because then the cartridges were so much. Well, some right? of us aren't as old as you, so we, you know, we don't. Uh, We're talking when so dinosaurs ruled the earth. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, um, so there is. Dangerous sad. time. Right. But we're talking about um, manufacturing equipment. It's, the equipment itself is typically very expensive. And the difference between a cheap uh, printer and a more expensive printer or more. Uh, uh, better quality, better built printer, one that would last longer, often is not that much. And people will be swayed by, uh, well, you know, that printer is $3,000 less. But you got to understand that often the return on the investment comes very quickly. People tend to look at uh, a number and say, well, I'm going to get the cheapest piece of equipment out there so that I can get into business. And, and I would not agree with that. Um, uh, unless, uh, uh, unless you can't afford a monthly payment for a larger uh, piece of equipment or it concerns you, I still, I still agree with Stan. Uh, try to get the best piece of equipment 
possible. And uh, you know, all salesmen out here, I'm a slimy salesman, uh, don't <laughs> listen to us. You know, you could, you could hear what we have to say, but you want to get out on the web, get on the forums, uh, see what people who are using the equipment have YouTube, to say. YouTube, right? Go to yeah, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube, other, other <laughs> yeah, shops, absolutely. other absolutely. shops, uh, get some advice from people, go see it in use, go see what people's real problems are. Right, because when, when you were talking to different sales reps and stuff, and it's not that, you know, a lot of them never even print it, you know, not to say he has an embroidery shop, you know, they have a, a shop, but a lot of people, they come in and they, they've been in the industry and they haven't printed. So go out, visit some customers, ask for some customers, and then go find your own customers that may have whatever piece of equipment that you may be looking at to just to get some vetting going so you can really hear what somebody who's using the machine every day uh, is, is running into, you know, is the, is the ink line, are they having any problems pre-treating, you know, how many, how, how often are they breaking thread or losing needles and different things like that, and, you know, definitely what he's saying is 1,000% is correct. I mean, I don't think there's very many people, especially beginners, that can go and look at the embroidery machines and tell that the basic stuff of the machine is good and doesn't break. You right. really got to talk to people and know the service record of other shops that, oh yeah, I had that machine still running 20 years later. Screen printing, same thing. I mean, you're not crawling under there and seeing what the axle is made of. You know, you have to ask somebody. I mean, I've been in a shop and certain machines and in 20 years they're in pieces and they're no good and you throw them in the trash and others, 25 years later, they're still working. So you really got to get out there and ask people who use the equipment. And you know, they're here and when you're walking around, talk to them. And you might also consider uh, asking people who are not in your immediate area because often a, uh, yeah. a manufacturer, not a manufacturer, but a, uh, someone who's using the equipment will mislead you because they view you as a potential competitor that's coming into their neighborhood and is going to take business from them. So uh, that will skew their uh, their answers. So that's that, why I That's why I always flew to the Long Beach show. Right. <laughs> right. Nobody cares. They're in California. Right. They right. don't care what you're doing. Different attitude out there. But um, yeah, I think that, uh, that and that's why the, uh, the web is useful, because you will get on the forums. You will get people that will bash equipment. Uh, you uh, will get people that will endorse it. I always say, take the best review, kick it out, because it's probably me reviewing the equipment, <laughs> and take the worst review and kick that out, because it's probably a competitor reviewing my equipment. And the truth lies somewhere in, in between there. And uh, that's what you, uh, what you should uh, look at. Look at the longevity of the equipment. Look at the warranty. Look at the service. Where is my technician? Uh, if I have a problem, what, is, what are you going to do to keep my equipment running and keep, it, keep me in business? So those are important issues. There is uh, nothing worse than buying an expensive piece of equipment that does not work. Yeah, and, then there, and there is a lot Try out there. Try to make your payments on that. Right. Um, so... so um, you mentioned uh, sometimes the manufacturer will finance. Yes. How so, about uh, what are the other options so, to go for the cash? Yeah, so financing, and, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to wade through some of this because sometimes fine, uh, manufacturers will offer financing because they have inferior equipment, and so they're looking for sales. How can I get sales? Well, let's do our own financing, but you're still stuck into a monthly lease but you have an inferior piece of equipment. So I would uh, research the equipment first, find out what, what one, two, or three uh, machines you want to buy, and then uh, at that point, you're going to ask them, well, what financing do you offer? Or what terms? So some terms, some companies will offer you um, net 30, net 60, net 90, uh, which is a nice thing to do. It's, it's fairly rare uh, because these are, um, these are sales companies. They're profit-driven, as we all are. And, uh, and they want the money in their account. They want to get it from you and get it into their account. So uh, what, about, what about leasing? How's and that? And then, so let's get to leasing. So, um, so there's a couple of, uh, there's actually a couple of things. I mean, if you can get a loan from a bank, your interest rate will be uh, lower typically. But the problem with banks is they don't understand the equipment. So dealing with a bank, even if you have a relationship for 20 years, they all say hello to you when you walk in the door. They love it when you deposit the money. But you want to borrow money? Well, that's a different story. So the loan officer will take your, your uh, information, but they're going to want to know, where is your return on investment? Uh, how are you going to get customers? 
Um, what does this equipment do? So it's like an endless array of questions and that goes from him to the bank manager. The bank manager sends it to corporate, corporate reviews it, and hopefully within six months, you, you'll get an answer. You'll get uh, either approved or declined. But that's six months you've lost getting into your business. So then there's leasing. Leasing typically will be a higher interest rate. The way it, it works is um, leasing usually goes one to five years. Uh, it will be based on a number of things. It'll be based on your credit score. It will be based on your years in business, if any. If you don't have any years in business, if you're brand new, uh, look at probably putting 20% of the, uh, the amount down. Uh, often leasing companies will finance you with zero down, uh, but you have to have good credit, uh, an existing business. They will want to see a tax return. They will want to see banking statements. But the great thing about a leasing company is that they will approve you within one, two, or three days. Um, there's a few things about leasing you need to know. It's not a loan. Um, you are locked into that lease from the beginning to the end. One to five years. You do not own that equipment until that lease is satisfied. With a loan, you own the equipment, you still have to pay the loan off. So if you decide, I want to sell this equipment, you're not going to sell that equipment until that lease is paid off. And the other thing about a lease is, Besides whatever you might have to put down, there typically is a balloon or a payoff amount at the end of it. So and that can either be a dollar or 10% of what you borrowed. Uh, obviously, a dollar sounds better, but these people are not idiots. They make money off your money. Um, and if you opt for a dollar buyout at the end, they're going to charge you more every month. So that's something to consider about leasing. Um, but uh, you know, a bank is a lot more impersonal. Uh, they, just don't, uh, they just don't understand the business. It's a much slower process. You may save a few percentage points on this. Um, and you also have to watch if you're going to leasing. There are a number of leasing companies out there. Some of them are, are, uh, are not that pleasant. Um, and you could get stuck. And I've seen over the years, the 20 years I've been with, uh, with Hirsch, I've seen leases written where there's no out. You lease until you decide that you're not going to be in business anymore. So you can keep paying, there is no buyout. You have to make sure that there's a buyout at the end. You have to make sure that your monthly payments are something that you can, uh, you can, you can live with. And, uh, and, can we go and, uh, out with pitchforks and torches and find these people? No, that again, sounds awful. Uh, again, <laughs> um, you're a little older. And uh, not so much on the pitchfork and, uh, and torches uh, these days. You know, that's more... Uh, more back Can we write face. bad Yelp reviews for you? Yes. <laughs> um, Doesn't seem as pleasant as well, beating the crap out of them, but go right, ahead. Right, right. Well, that's, you know, I'm a New Yorker. You know, we, that is our way. You know, we'll come by and we'll break your leg if we have to. But, uh, but that's, that's really, um, it, it's a simple process. It's typically a one or two page um, application, and then they're going to want some financial records. The approval is quick. The, cr the, um, the percentage is typically higher. But you also have to understand your monthly payments are usually a write-off against any profit that you may have. So even though you might be paying six, eight hundred, a thousand, whatever per month, you may be taking that, that payment off at the end of the year off any profit you have, paying less taxes. And that's something that if you're using an accountant, you want to run that past them. Um, so th that, that's an important uh, consideration as well. What about a credit card? Um, credit card's great. But uh, credit cards, 20% interest, um, and um, if not worse, most companies, right? credit cards charge the, um, charge the person who's swiping the card 3%. And if you're buying a piece of equipment for $100,000, well, they want that 3% back. So they will charge you the credit card fee. Oh, no, so, it's the not cash fee, isn't it? Right. It's the, uh, right, welcome to the club 3% fee, uh, or whatever that credit card is. Um, it's getting more and more common where uh, credit cards are convenient, but there's actually going to be a cost involved. Everybody says, put it on my credit card. I want the points. I want to go to Aruba. But, but they're going to charge you for that. So you're going to wind up paying more. And you're going to have to pay that credit card at the end of the month, or you're going to have to pay that interest month after month after month. And it's, it's definitely not the preferred way to go. I've seen um, some people get in big holes that way, yeah, right? Absolutely. You don't want to get in a big hole. You know, that, that's it. You're here to make money. You're here to grow your business. Um, it's, it's, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. 
Uh, it's, there's something here for every, everybody. You can, I, I've been doing this so long, and people say, well, how much longer do you think you could do this? Well, even during the pandemic, when everything shut down, this industry thrived. And uh, I can't tell you why. It's, it's like one of the three necessary things that people, uh, that people need, food, clothing, shelter. Well, clothing is in there, and that's what you're doing. And I didn't all know embroidery was one of them. It is. It's actually <laughs> it's, it's essential. All you're doing, it's not embroidery, it's screen printing, it's direct-to-garment, it's whatever apparel decorating you're doing. You're taking what people are passionate about and putting it on a shirt, hat, or jacket. You love fishing? I put a striped bass on his hat, I put his name on there, and he thinks you're a hero. And then he goes out on a boat, where did you get that hat? The boat, they need towels for all their customers, and somebody from IBM works there. It just goes in so many different directions. And then all that so, money goes to the leasing company. <laughs> um, well, you know, you hope to get out from under the leasing company. You know, that, that is, that's, a, that's a sad point, but... Um, I think with but, leasing, you really gotta look at the, um, Longevity of the equipment, that, that's about the saddest thing I've seen. People yeah, that are definitely. paying leases on think, stuff that doesn't work anymore. Things, I think right. two things that he said is that buyout. So I, when I was early on and I went through some financing for something that I was getting, and I'm like, you know, hey, can I, can I, if I get the money up early enough, can I pay it off? And they're like, yeah, you can pay it off. I said, so is it going to be at a discounted rate? No. So it, it ends up being, let's say it's $5,000 to buy the equipment, and by the time you pay it off, it's $15,000 regardless of how long you had to lease or anything like that. So that's really important. The second thing is, if it's a piece of equipment that you want that's here, it may be a dream piece of equipment, figure out the right time to see where you are in the process, right? Like go through the process, see where you are, figure out what is attainable, because they'll give you like an idea of what it is that you know you need to do or where you need to be in order to afford it, just to see, okay, my payments will be. You may not be quite ready for it today, but down the road you understand where you're trying to get to so that you can afford that piece of equipment. And by the way, leasing companies, some leasing companies will also write loans. They'll finance it outright. So uh, again, they make money off your money. So you're not gonna be getting a loan at two or 3%. They're gonna charge you about 10 or 12%. But at that point, it's a loan, it's not a lease. So you can, there are different options. And there's different tax advantages to each. And that's something that you should speak to your accountant with. Also, if, you, if your business uh, is big enough, there's something called a Section 179 in the tax bill that, uh, that uh, you should speak to your accountant about because they will, uh, up to about $250,000, I believe, uh, can come off your profits uh, using the Section 179 code. Uh, but that's, that's an accountant uh, thing to... Uh, to get involved with. All right, so. we're talking about something real scary, that, but I know people do it. Some people borrow off something else, right? Yeah. Like well, you can well, borrow off your house and buy a piece <laughs> yes. of equipment? So, well, actually, that's what I did. Um, they, the, 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 um, the, the, the common knowledge is do not tie your home to your equipment. If your business fails, you do not want to lose your home because you could not pay for that embroidery machine. I knew that I was not gonna let that happen. So my first piece of equipment, I was fortunate I was able to pay it outright. As the business quickly grew, I wanted to, um, I wanted to get more equipment. Uh, I might not have had the funding. I had a home equity line, I used that. Uh, my accountant went nuts. He goes, you never do that. You know, why do that? That's the wrong thing to do. But you know what? You pay it off. So it's, it, it's that, you know, at that point, you'll, if you're fortunate to get a, an equity line of credit, that would be uh, another cheaper way to go. It's not highly recommended. But another good point is that um, banks will also require collateral for a loan. They'll require something, equity, stock, something that you're going to put down to guarantee that loan. Leasing companies, their equity is the equipment. So they will, they will take your equipment back. That's what they're, that's what they, that's the skin in the game for those people. So they will finance you knowing that if you don't make it, if they have to take that equipment back, they know that they could sell it quicker. And that's another thing about leasing is if you buy a higher end piece of equipment, you'll typically get a lower interest rate and they want that equipment back because they will resell it on the market as a used piece of equipment and make more money. So um, if you're buying a piece of equipment that they cannot resell quickly, they're not as quick to approve you 
and they think that if, well, we ever have to take this piece of equipment back, how are we going to get rid of it? So everything starts to get more expensive. So you're saving money on the equipment because it's a cheaper piece of equipment, but on the financing, it becomes a wash. So that's a lot a, of calculations required, right? Yeah, no question. And then something else is when you get approved, you may get approved for more than what you actually need, right? And then next thing you know, the salesman's like, well, you got approved for 30000 and you only needed twenty. And they're going to try to find a way to sell you ten more thousand dollars worth of stuff that you don't necessarily need. Oh, yeah. So don't get caught up in that trap either. It's like, you know, if you know, hey, maybe you do need a little bit of consumables on top of that or something like that. But don't just go max out whatever you're approved for just because the bank came back and said, you know, you got good credit and here is another ten thousand dollars or something. They will try to sell you with your embroidery machine. Uh, I don't know, a pre-treat machine, and you did no, no need for it at all, you know? So just keep that in mind as well. No, you touched on it a little, but I think in either case of a beginner or advanced uh, equipment purchase, you also have to worry that you don't use all your money up because you're going to need more, right? I mean, people, I, I've seen people with screen printing equipment not ready for the, all the other things they're going to have to buy, right? Yeah, you, you want to think it through, and that's true. Um, you, will, you most likely will get approved for more than you need. Um, a slimier salesman will say, well, let me get all that money into our pockets. There's no need for that. You get what you need to, to get your business going. Uh, if you've got expanded credit, it's nice to know. Well, I've got it. If I you need, you got to buy more thread. You yeah, got to buy more well, hoops. But thread whatever. is fairly inconsequential. Usually, ink is like an expensive commodity. In embroidery, to do a left chest design, you're talking ten cents. Uh, you know, that's your consumable. Your thread, your bobbin, your backing. I guess On, screen printing, where you got to buy screen. Screen printing is another and animal. You have to expand so, your screen yeah, room, and right. you don't. People don't think that through. Right, sometimes. and that is true. You want to think the process. Even through. with small, if you get a hand press, you got to get. Yeah, you, you got a bigger get a hand press. Stuff. You got to get more screens, right? Yeah. More ink. I mean, ink does add up, right? Yeah, definitely. The consumables are a thing in, in screen printing that you can't get away from. It's going to be a, it's, it's almost like rent, pretty much. Whether it's a motion, you're going to get a gallon. The more screens you do, you know, it might be a gallon a week sometimes, or, or you might be starting to buy a lot more ink. White ink is going to go very, very fast. You know, you may start with one gallon. Next thing you know, you're buying fives. And you talked about it the other day, five quickly could turn into 25. Yeah. Uh, and, and being able to, to have enough for you to do the job. So it's definitely the consumables are something that a lot of people don't necessarily consider you know I think embroidery is more so time is what I yeah, find right. I outsource it I outsource my embroidery but you think about like how long how many stitches how long is the run time how many heads you got you know all of those things that is true we run 28 heads you know typically a startup is a one head so we both get a hundred piece order you got to run your machine a hundred times I got to run my machines four times but the consumable you know the amount of thread you know we get you on the machine purchase that's the expense the other key thing in starting a business is keep your overhead to a minimum. If you can run the equipment yourself without having to hire employees, and you should know how to run your own equipment, um, keep the overhead down. And as the business grows and as you cannot handle it, um, then you start looking to hire people, train them, uh, bring them in. Pay but, rent. Yeah, pay rent. Yeah, they, I mean, and, and that's another thing. You've got to figure out what your shop cost is, your hourly shop cost. So you want to take all your expenses. This includes uh, rent, utilities, your pay, your profit, your consumables, everything. We get everything. paid for this? Um, uh, well, again, you know. Uh, <laughs> On a good day. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, you... Uh, you want to take that number and you want to boil it down to how much do I have to be, how much do I have to make to be in this place every month? And then divide it by four to a weekly number, divide it down to how many days you want to work. I need to make this amount of money in this day in order to make my monthly, uh, my, month, my, my, my nuts, so to speak. And then boil it down to the hour. When you say, well, now I know that I need $40 an hour just to do business. And that's my profit, my overhead, everything. Um, and then somebody comes in with a job. And here it is. Here's uh, 10 pieces. What do I have to make? This job's going to take me an hour, and I got 10 pieces. I got to at least make $4 a piece just to make what I need to make. Do not give it away. A common thing in embroidery is, and you'll see it everywhere, you got to charge a dollar per thousand stitches. But that's right for 1% of the people out there. You have to figure out what your monthly, daily, 
hourly cost is and you charge accordingly and somebody comes in and they go, ah, oh, you know, Bob down the block, he's going to do it for 17 cents less. Well, you know, if your machines aren't busy, take the job and do the job because if the machines are not making, what they say, if your machines don't make noise, you're not going to buy any toys. So you, you, you have to keep your equipment running. Um, it's not going it, to, it doesn't make you money sitting there and looking pretty. It has to run. So even if you're below your shop cost uh, or your hourly wage, you want to keep that machine running. And as you grow, that bottom feeder that, uh, that, wanted a, that, that came to you that uh, was going to uh, get you on a lower price, you either raise his price or get rid of him. And, and fill your business with better quality customers. And it'll make your life a lot better. I knew you were a good salesman, but it's the, the whole no, no noise, no toys, huh? I like no that. Noise, yeah, 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 you may use that. that. That's line. a keeper. That's yeah, a keeper. that's out there. That's, that's for everybody. You have um, videos about like putting the money, making yeah, sure you yeah. figure out your so costs, right? We, we talked about that yesterday, in, like what I call organizer hustle. I forgot what you named it, but I think what he's saying is important. And if you're not in a position where you have a shop and you're working out of your house, you got a plan for where you want to be. So what he's saying about like figuring out your hourly cost, when I, I think back to me, you know, 2012, trying to figure out how much to charge based on all of these formulas. And I looked at it and I got overwhelmed because, man, I don't have rent. You know, I'm just out of my house and different things like that. But we always establish prices. We're afraid to establish prices or we don't know why we charge what we charge. But if you, if you plan to get into a, a retail space, you need to plan for that now. Just because you're out of your spare, room, spare bedroom or your garage doesn't mean that you should be charging less because once you elevate, it's hard to raise your prices. People are, we, we, you know, I got asked this the other day. She wanted to raise her price $3 more. And she's had the same price for, for like three or five years or something like that. And we get, we're afraid. But if you plan accordingly, you know how much it costs you on an hourly rate to run your shop. You have goals. And every day you're not going to hit your goal. You know, something goes wrong. Your machine goes down. You're not going to hit it. But there will be more days where you exceed that if you're, you know, you're running optimally where it'll balance itself out. But, you know, so don't get trapped in like, man, I didn't hit it this week. But next week you might do two times what it was that's supposed to be the last week or, you know, different things like that. And what he said about paying yourself is, is beyond true. You know, I find that a lot of small people, small businesses rather, they rob themselves because they just take money out of their business. Just take money. It's your money. Don't get us wrong. But figure out how, what you need to live off of. What is your comfortable number so that now you can include that. And the easiest way to get an employee is to actually pay yourself. So now it's like I pay myself a fair rate, wage for this $15 an hour, whatever it may be in your area. Now when you go and pay somebody else that $15 an hour, it doesn't seem like an expense. You know, and now you can say, I'm going to pay you $15 an hour, and now I just bought back 40 hours of time that I can go out and, you know, you take 40 hours, $15 an hour, 600 bucks. It's like, man, I can find two jobs, and that employee's paid for for the week, and I still got five or four days left in the week to actually go out and make more profit. So, you know, where's your time best used in what it is that you're actually offering people? And sometimes we definitely have to look at and break down all of our goals, where we want to be, how much is our operating cost for where we want to be in the future as well so that we can price and, and position ourselves accordingly. I'm going to touch on one other thing that you guys mentioned just for emphasis. Just because someone will lend you the money does not mean you should take it. Well, right? if, like, if you, so if that you if you're you, getting that, what, what, you know, what can you afford is really more important than what you can get, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, how about we, yep. uh, do you guys have any burning things to say or should we go to questions? Go to questions. All right, who's got a question about financing? I'll repeat the question. All right, so the question is, um, talking about buying equipment, but what if the consumables are as much as the equipment costs? So you can buy what you need for the job, right? Like I tell people, learn what you need to do for this job because it's way too much to learn. You can get overly, you can get over and over, overwhelmed. I'm trying to, lost the word. You're you overwhelmed. You get overwhelmed with just, even just coming to the show for the first time and seeing the equipment. I remember when I was there. So if you talk about consumables, if you need white ink for this job, just buy white ink for this job. If you need red ink this next week, you know, in your first couple of jobs as you get going, you're going to have a ton left over. We're talking about inks, you know, thread. You know, my friend who has an embroidery shop, he's like, man, they gave me thread. I'm still making money. I done paid for the machine off the thread that they supplied me with. 
you know, when you're starting out. But when it comes to consumer, you buy what you need at the moment. And one job will probably pay like a gallon of ink is like 50 something dollars. You'll profit that. And you'll have 100 jobs left in that gallon of ink or whatever the case is. So buy what you need. And then you'll have a, you know, maybe you only start out with five or seven colors. You know, I got these colors. And if somebody comes in, you know, you can charge a little more if they have something. Hey, that's a special color we don't normally offer. If just you want don't it, go, it's going to cost you a little bit more. Just don't go overboard. Yeah, it's definitely. it's real easy to see. Oh, that twenty five gallons of white ink is way cheaper per gallon. But you know, sitting on it, it's the money out of your pocket, and you got to realize that's yeah. that's a cost, like an equipment and track cost it. almost. And you got to track it. You yeah. know, so so you know, it's hard when they say like ten cents of of, of uh, embroidery right. or yeah. or ink. When it comes to like ink, it's hard to really track how much ink is going on to a shirt. You know, they weigh the shirt and they measure it versus all, like it's really, really hard to do that. But you want to look at you. You should have it written down. This month I spent, you know, this much on consumables. Next month I spent that much because you'll t start to figure out it is literally a payment, you know, that you have to make every month because it's just in your business. You know, you may be spending four or five. You get a bigger shop, thousands of dollars a month in order to keep the shop running on consumables. It is a, uh, it's a great industry. Uh, everybody can make a living here. Do not operate out of desperation. You do not want to, you know, I've got $50,000 I gotta pay back. I'm gonna take this customer. This customer wants to pay you nothing for your services because they don't value what you do. You do not need that customer. Um, kick them to the side because it's just not worth your time. Kick and those, them hard. And those, <laughs> and those customers typically are the worst. worst they will worst. give you the hardest time. They will, they will nitpick over the, the, the smallest items. You're all going to see it if you haven't seen it already. Um, you want to build your business based on your reputation, the quality work you do, and the type of customers you have. And, and, you know, and I'm not going to say you're going to be happy. I mean, it is work. It's still work. Nothing happens for free. But, uh, but there'll be a lot less stress. And that's, uh, you know, we all strive for that to, to some extent. It's funny so. you say that. You know, I've been doing this, as you so nicely pointed About out, since years dinosaurs yeah. ruled the earth. But I've never heard of anybody that got rid of a customer that regretted it. If they did it on purpose. Yeah, true. If they yes. did it on purpose. Yes, we're actually in the process of, uh, of culling a lot of our customers over the years. And I'm going to tell you, when you try yes. to throw them out, they will hang on like... They got an umbilical cord. They will, they will not go because they know nobody else will do that work for, for that cheap and nobody will do that quality. They've got you. They want to hold on to you. So it's, it's difficult, but uh, you got to make them understand that I got to make a living. I have, I'm in this not to serve you as much as I got to eat, you know, and I got to make my expenses. So if I'm not doing that, I should be doing something else. You know, that, that's important. We do a lot of work for brokers, and uh, one of them once like, was like, oh, you know, I got to do what I got to do to put food on my table. And then when he walked away, I told my friend, yeah, his, I, I'm talking about eating. He's talking about driving to the grocery store in a Lexus. So some people cry poor, and they got a different idea poor, yeah. I'll tell you. Right. Did um, that guy just pull away in a Maserati, and I'm giving it this for, for nothing? I used to have a guy in a fancy <laughs> sports car. We'd come up, drive over and tell me why he couldn't pay me right. yet. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and more questions about financing. I, I, I would say um, pick a quality leasing company if you're going to lease. All right, so the question is uh, how much of a waste factor what do you What type build of work in? are you doing? Yeah. All right, so. Um, I learned this very, very early on. It's like, you know, some pe people who supply garments, so this is where I caught the lesson. They want to bring their own garments in, so they just want to pay what they, what they actually are, you know, whatever, screen printing, just that fee. But it only takes one small mishap and the shirt is ruined. So, you know, you have to charge a handling fee, you know, which was a dollar at the time, even if they're bringing you their own garment. So you have to add that in, whether it's 50 cents or a dollar, you figure it out. But you want to track what your error rate is, obviously. You know, if, if you know I could do 100 shirts and I got like three shirts that might be messed up, you want to build that in. Sometimes you want to order extra of every size. I've seen people do it a lot of ways, you know, and taking your time, especially when you got employees, is more likely to happen. You know, I got, hey, I printed black on the top half of these sweatsuits. I printed white on the bottom half. 
like, man, what am I going to do? These sweatsuits are pretty much the whole profit for the job. So, you know, how you set things up and different things like that is going to be really, really important to, you know, what you're talking about. But obviously, we can't avoid the mistakes in the, in the business. It just happens. So adding in a little rate, and then that's where the markup comes in as well. It's like, you know, how much are you marking up your garments? And you kind of, like, figure out where you need to be as far as, like, uh, what that number should be based on your error rate as well. We um, figure on screen printing, one and a half percent per side printed is going to be reject. So if it's a contract person, we make them supply that many more, and we don't pay for anything that's that's uh, under that. They have to pay that. Um, and then we charge a dollar extra for embroidery of uh, what we call premium items because if you ruin them, it's just ungodly yeah, expensive. That, that, you ruin a Nike duffel bag or, right. or a Carhartt jacket, and it's so expensive. So we add to that as well. Do not, uh, do not print or embroider on something that cannot be replaced. Do not uh, print on somebody's great-grandmother's wedding dress that for the $7 you were going to make and the machine did something that it shouldn't have done and now you've got a problem. Do not print on $400 leather jackets. Give them to your worst competitor. You know, I don't do leather, but go to Rick down the block. He loves that kind of stuff. That's what you want to do. Don't take those. Strive to be as good as you can possibly be with the medium that you're working. So you will have mistakes. It's part of the process. You want to keep that to a minimum. I know people do build in a certain percentage into it. I typically don't. Uh, and there are two types of uh, business that come in. Either they're supplying their own garments, where you have to let them know that there could be a problem, there's going to be waste. I will not be responsible for any, any problems because I did not supply these garments. And then there's the customers where you are, as a wholesaler, supplying the garments to them, uh, in which you're charging them more so that if you do have some waste or error, that you could easily order extra pieces and, and not take a hit on that. And if it's so, expensive, you better get approval in spades. Like, you know, a picture of the embroidery comes back that they approved. I mean, if it's a lot of shirts or extensive, we get them to sign a shirt and send it back. That's the sample that they approved. You, you've got to protect yourself because the quickest way to go out of business is to ruin a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And it's even worse when you didn't ruin it and they're just a jerk. So you got to cover yourself. I would so. say something else to add to that is, is when you're trying to do something new for the first time, sometimes like it's like basically saying it's find your niche, understand what you're, what you're offering and not go out exploring sometimes. I know early on we get caught up in just saying yes to everything. And sometimes it's like by the time you get done a job, regardless of what you charge, if you messed up or not, by the time you just put all the hours in to try to figure it out, to go find the right, you know, uh, whatever it is that you had to buy off the internet to get it done, you, you're, you really lost money. And I think it's great to experiment early on, but once you find your pocket of, you know, the stuff that you want to do, that you enjoy doing, that is easy, it's quickly, quick for you to make money doing, to stay inside that pocket and, you know, outsource and make sure you build relationships with people, multiple relationships. You gotta have three embroiders. You gotta, because people get busy the same way you get busy. Artwork, Graphic designers are flaky, and we all know that that side of the industry is very, very hard to keep consistent. So have enough people around you, so you know you can take a, a smaller fee and, and still keep your customers, your customers, and keep them happy. So just because you can figure something out doesn't mean you should figure stuff out. So I love figuring out stuff. So my employees, when I start, they see it in my eye that I want to like do a job because I'd like to figure it out. They go, "That's arts and crafts." Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. You can't make money. Like when you're going to figure out something new for the first time, like uh, someone brings you some waterproof jackets and you never printed them before. Yeah, it's fun to figure it out, but, man, you can lose a lot of time and yeah, a lot definitely. of money figuring yeah. out some something that you don't know. Some companies specialize on that. They, they thrive off of that market, but it's a premium, man. Like, a lot of people don't know. Like, we don't ever get to print on OGO book bags and some of these hiring items, but it's a huge market. But it is a very, very costly market if you don't have the right people working for you, the right equipment, and you definitely don't want to be printing, you know, these cheap transfers on a on a North Face jacket, you know. But the margins on those jackets are are, are great if you are, you know, able to print on them and, and handle some of the problems that come with them. All right, other uh, questions.
If you're starting out, what's uh, what's the it's the cost? You mean? Yeah, digitizing versus heat transfers. Um, the cost of digitizing versus heat that's like a little yeah. weird. But Di- nah, that's so like digi- do you walk to school or carry your lunch? Digitizing <laughs> and vectoring, I guess, would be kind of like the comparable aspects of like the artwork piece. So you need to have some type of artwork for them to even take to get digitized. Uh, and if they have like vector artwork, it's easier for them to break down because you guys have to re-vector it first in order to set the stitches because they have to set the colors apart. So, you know, that's kind of the difference. You know, if you're thinking about heat transfers or screen print or anything like that, it's per color. Vector artwork is per color. You got vector versus bitmap or raster, which is like Photoshop versus Illustrator. And then digitizing goes in a little bit deeper into uh, actual putting, laying stitches into your artwork so that the machine knows where to put the put the threads. Yeah, I mean, if it's very few garments, it's going to be cheaper to get transfers than digitize something and embroider it, especially since after it's digitized, you may have to sew it out and uh, it doesn't work and you have to redone or something. Yeah, and trans- Whereas the vector art, you know, for a transfer is going to look when you make that transfer, pretty much exactly what you send them. Yeah, but today where we're going and we're talking about uh, DTF a little bit later, uh, which is direct to film, is like you've gotten to be so forgiving now. Like, you know, your customer sends you some bad artwork. You can kind of print it these days with some of the technology uh, that's going around. So, uh, you know, everything now is like it's free game over, sir. You know, you just want to make sure you're not using bad artwork from, you know, the Internet where it's copywritten and all of that stuff. But, you know, different processes take different types of artwork and you want to figure out you know what the customer needs and you can kind of talk customers into what you want them to get as well based on the cost associated so if they're not coming in uh, expecting to pay a lot of money and they want embroidery you know hey we need digitizing fee before we even tell you what the exact cost is going to be uh because we don't know how many stitches going to be i'm pretty sure they got a they can look at it, think of left chest, you know, six, 8,000 stitches. But, you know, if that's not something that you're versed in, you don't know if they want to fold back embroidered, yeah, the digitizing is going to cost you. The, the, the stitches are going to cost you. So Yeah, typically uh, me being primarily an embroiderer, and this is like an entirely different topic from financing. But um, if you've got somebody that's coming in for three, four, five shirts, they have artwork, they want it digitized, they're going to pay for that digitizing, plus a little bit of a surcharge. You got somebody coming in with 500 shirts, and they want digitizing. Do it. Just give it to them and spread it out over the yeah, course of the shirts. Yeah, add a few pennies, gonna, right? Yeah, it's going to come out to nothing. So, uh, and Tell you have the file. Free. Once you have the no file, digitizing. you can make a million of them. It doesn't matter. Each medium has its own setup. Um, so, vinyl has a setup. Uh, direct to film is more. Uh, you just have to have clean artwork. So it's garbage in, garbage out. You're going to give me bad artwork? Well, guess what you're going to get back on your shirt. So you want to make sure it's clean and good. And, and, and with that, uh, my company puts an electronic monitoring bracelet on my ankle. And if I don't get back there, yeah, they're going to give say, me a jolt. And oh, that's just way, way more clever than yeah, I was right, going to end this. All right. So I got to move. But uh, How about yeah. a, a hand for uh, yeah. Stan and thank Gary? You. And I want to thank the sponsors. See them listed there. And uh, thanks for coming. Gary's at the Hirsch booth, stands around. If you want to ask questions, Stan will be back at uh, 1 o'clock talking about DTF.